When I'm online, I watch tomorrowpictures.tv. Been doing music since I was like 12 years old, maybe younger than that. Music touches your soul in a way that love can't. It does something to you, whether you realize it or not. Adding important lyrics to it, that's something that's going to stick with that person forever. Where do I want to be? Watching tomorrowpictures.tv. Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities. Smith, Nixon. In the election of 1860, Abraham Lincoln said the question was whether this nation could exist half slave or half free. In the election of 1960 and with the world around us, the question is whether the world will exist half slave or half free whether it will move in the direction of freedom, in the direction of the road that we are taking, or whether it will move in the direction of slavery. I think it will depend in great measure upon what we do here in the United States, on the kind of society that we build, on the kind of strength that we maintain. We discuss tonight domestic issues, but I would not want that to be any implication to be given that this does not involve directly our struggle with Mr. Khrushchev for survival. Mr. Khrushchev is in New York, and he maintains the communist offensive throughout the world because of the productive power of the Soviet Union itself. The Chinese communists have always had a large population, but they are important and dangerous now because they are mounting a major effort within their own country. The kind of country we have here, the kind of society we have, the kind of strength we build in the United States will be the defense of freedom. If we do well here, if we meet our obligations, if we're moving ahead, then I think freedom will be secure around the world. If we fail, then freedom fails. Therefore, I think the question before the American people is, are we doing as much as we can do? Are we as strong as we should be? Are we as strong as we must be if we're going to maintain our independence? And if we're going to maintain and hold out the hand of friendship to those who look to us for assistance, to those who look to us for survival? I should make it very clear that I do not think we're doing enough, that I am not satisfied as an American with the progress that we're making. This is a great country, but I think it could be a greater country. And this is a powerful country, but I think it could be a more powerful country. I'm not satisfied to have 50% of our steel mill capacity unused. I'm not satisfied when the United States had last year the lowest rate of economic growth of any major industrialized society in the world because economic growth means strength and vitality. It means we're able to sustain our defenses. It means we're able to meet our commitments abroad. I'm not satisfied when we have over $9 billion worth of food, some of it rotting, even though there is a hungry world, and even though 4 million Americans wait every month for a food package from the government, which averages 5 cents a day per individual. I saw cases in West Virginia, here in the United States, where children took home part of their school lunch in order to feed their families because I don't think we're meeting our obligation towards these Americans. I'm not satisfied when the Soviet Union is turning out twice as many scientists and engineers as we are. I'm not satisfied when many of our teachers are inadequately paid or when our children go to school part-time shifts. I think we should have an educational system second to none. I'm not satisfied when I see men like Jimmy Hoffa in charge of the largest union in the United States still free, I'm not satisfied when we are failing to develop the natural resources of the United States to the fullest. Here in the United States, which developed the Tennessee Valley and which built the Grand Coulee and the other dams in the Northwest United States, at the present rate of hydropower production, and that is the hallmark of an industrialized society, the Soviet Union by 1975 will be, be producing more power than we are. These are all the things I think in this country that can make our society strong or can mean that it stands still. I'm not satisfied until every American enjoys his full constitutional rights. If a Negro baby is born, and this is true also of Puerto Ricans and Mexicans in some of our cities, 
he has about one half as much chance to get through high school as a white baby. He has one third as much chance to get through college as a white student. He has about a third as much chance to be a professional man, about half as much chance to own a house. He has about the four times as much chance that he'll be out of work in his life as the white baby. I think we can do better. I don't want the talents of any American to go to waste. I know that there are those who say that we want to turn everything over to the government. I don't at all. I want the individuals to meet their responsibility. And I want the states to meet their responsibility. But I think there is also a national responsibility. The argument has been used against every piece of social legislation in the last 25 years. The people of the United States individually could not have developed the Tennessee Valley. Collectively, they could have. A cotton farmer in Georgia or a peanut farmer, or a dairy farmer in Wisconsin or Minnesota. He cannot protect himself against the forces of supply and demand in the marketplace, but working together in effective governmental program, he can do so. 17 million Americans who live over 65 on an average Social Security check of about $78 a month, they're not able to sustain themselves individually, but they can sustain themselves through the Social Security system. I don't believe in big government, but I believe in effective governmental action. And I think that's the only way that the United States is going to maintain its freedom. It's the only way that we're going to move ahead. I think we can do a better job. I think we're going to have to do a better job if we are going to meet the responsibilities which time and events have placed upon us. We cannot turn the job over to anyone else. If the United States fails, then the whole cause of freedom fails. And I think it depends in great measure on what we do here in this country. The reason Franklin Roosevelt was a good neighbor in Latin America was because he was a good neighbor in the United States. Because they felt that the American society was moving again. I want us to recapture that image. I want people in Latin America and Africa and Asia to start to look to America, to see how we're doing things, to wonder what the President of the United States is doing, and not to look at Khrushchev or look at the Chinese Communists. That is the obligation upon our generation. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt said in his inaugural that this generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I think our generation of Americans has the same rendezvous. The question now is, can freedom be maintained under the most severe attack, attack it has ever known? I think it can be. And I think in the final analysis, it depends upon what we do here. I think it's time America started moving again. And now the opening statement by Vice President Richard M. Nixon. Smith, Senator Kennedy. The things that Senator Kennedy has said, many of us can agree with. There is no question but that we cannot discuss our internal affairs in the United States without recognizing that they have a tremendous bearing on our international position. There is no question but that this nation cannot stand still because we are in a deadly competition, a competition not only with the men in the Kremlin, but the men in Peking. We're ahead in this competition, as Senator Kennedy, I think, is implied. But when you're in a race, the only way to stay ahead is to move ahead. And I subscribe completely to the spirit that Senator Kennedy has expressed tonight, the spirit that the United States should move ahead. Where then do we disagree? I think we disagree on the implication of his remarks tonight and on the statements that he has made on many occasions during his campaign to the effect that the United States has been standing still. We heard of that later. Looking then to this problem of how the United States should move ahead and where the United States is moving, I think it is well that we take the advice of a very famous campaigner. Let's look at the record. Is the United States standing still? Is it true that this administration that Senator Kennedy has charged has been an administration of retreat, of defeat, of stagnation? Is it true that as far as this country is concerned, in the field of electric power, in all of the fields that he has mentioned, we have not been moving ahead? Well, we have a comparison that we can make. We have the record 
of the Truman administration of seven and a half years and the seven and a half years of the school. We have built more schools in these last seven and a half years than we built in the previous seven and a half, for that matter, in the previous 20 years. Let's take hydroelectric power. We have developed more hydroelectric power in these seven and a half years than was developed in any previous administration in history. Let us take hospitals. We find that more have been built in this administration than in the previous administration. The same is true of there's been more growth in this administration than in its predecessor. But let's not put it there. Let's put it in terms of the average family. What has happened to you? We find have gone up five times as much in the Eisenhower administration as they did in the Truman administration. What about the prices you pay? We find that the prices you pay went up five times as much in the Truman administration as they did in the Eisenhower administration. What's the net result of this? This means that the average family income went up 15% in the Eisenhower years as against 2% in the Truman years. Now, this is not standing still. But, good as this record is, may I emphasize, it isn't enough. A record is never something to stand on. It's something to build on. And in building on this record, I believe that we have the secret for progress. We know the way to progress. And I think, first of all, our own record proves that we know the way. Senator Kennedy has suggested that he believes he knows the way. I respect the sincerity with him, which he makes that suggestion. But on the other hand, when we look at the various programs that he offers, they do not seem to be new. They seem to be simply retreads of the programs of the Truman administration which preceded him. And I would suggest that during the course of the evening he might indicate those areas in which his programs are new, where they will mean more progress than we have then. What kind of programs are we for? We are for programs that will expand educational opportunities, that will give to all Americans their equal chance for education, for all of the things which are necessary and dear to the hearts of our people. We are for programs in addition, which will see that our medical care for the aged uh, is, are much, is much better handled than it is at the present time. Here again, may I indicate that Senator Kennedy and I are not in agreement as to the aim. We both want to help the old people. We want to see that they do have adequate medical care. The question is the means. I think that the means that I advocate will reach that goal better than the means that he advocates. I could give better examples, but for, for whatever it is, whether it's in the field of housing, or health, or medical care, or schools, or the development of electric power, we have programs which we believe will move America, move her forward and build on the wonderful record that we have made over these past seven and a half years. Now, when we look at these programs, might I suggest that in evaluating them, we often have a tendency to say that the test of a program is how much you're spending. I will concede that in all the areas to which I have referred, Senator Kennedy would have the federal government spend more than I would have it spend. I costed out the cost of the Democratic platform. It runs a minimum of 13 and two tenths billion dollars a year more than we are presently spending to a maximum of 18 billion dollars a year more than we're presently spending. Now the Republican platform will cost more too. It will cost a minimum of four billion dollars a year more, a maximum of four and nine tenths billion dollars a year more than we're presently spending. Now, does this mean that his program is better than ours? Not at all. Because it isn't a question of how much the federal government spends. It isn't a question of which government does the most. It's a question of which administration does the right thing. And in our case, I do believe that our programs will stimulate the creative energies of 180 million free Americans. I believe the programs that Senator Kennedy advocates will have a tendency to stifle those creative energies. I believe, in other words, that his programs would lead to the stagnation of the motive power that we need in this country to get progress. The final point that I would like to make is this. Senator Kennedy has suggested in his speeches that we lack compassion for the poor, for the old, and for others that are unfortunate. Let us understand throughout this campaign that his motives and mine are sincere. I know what it means to be poor. I know what it means to see people who are unemployed. 
I know Senator Kennedy feels as deeply about these problems as I do. But our disagreement is not about the goals for America, but only about the means to reach those goals. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. That completes the opening statements, and now the candidates will answer questions or comment upon one another's answers to questions put by correspondents of the networks. The correspondents. I'm Sandra Van Oker, NBC News. I'm Charles Warren, Mutual News. I'm Stuart Novin, CBS News. Bob Fleming, ABC News. The first question to Senator Kennedy from Mr. Fleming. Senator, the vice president in his campaign has said that you are naive and at times immature. He has raised the question of leadership. On this issue, why do you think people should vote for you rather than the vice president? Well, the vice president and I came to the Congress together in 1946. We both served in the Labor Committee. I've been there now for 14 years, the same period of time that he has. So that our experience in uh, government is comparable. Secondly, I think the question is, uh, what are the programs that we advocate? What is the party record that we lead? I come out of the Democratic Party, which in this century has produced Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, and which supported and sustained these programs which I've discussed tonight. Mr. Nixon comes out of the Republican Party. He was nominated by it. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged, development of the Tennessee Valley, development of our natural resources. I think Mr. Nixon is an effective leader of his party. I hope he would grant me the same. The question before us is, which point of view and which party do we want to lead the United States? Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. The next question, Mr. Novin. Mr. Vice President, your campaign stresses the value of your eight-year experience, and the question arises as to whether that experience was as an observer or as a participant or as an initiator of policy making. Would you tell us please specifically what major proposals you have made in the last... We'll call to cover them in eight and in two and a half minutes. I would suggest that these proposals could be mentioned. First, after each of my foreign trips, I have made recommendations that have been adopted. For example, after my first trip abroad, uh, abroad I strongly recommended that we increase our exchange programs, particularly as they related to exchange of persons of leaders in the labor field and in the information field. After my trip to South America, I made recommendations that a separate inter-American lending agency be set up, which the South American nations would like much better than, a lend than to participate in the lending agencies, which treated all the countries of the world the same. Uh, I have made other recommendations after each of the other trips, for example, after my trip abroad to Hungary, I made some recommendations with regard to the Hungarian refugee situation, which were adopted not only by the president, but some of them were enacted into law by the Congress. Within the administration, as a chairman of the President's Committee on Price Stability and Economic Growth, I have had the opportunity to make recommendations which have been adopted within the administration and which I think have been reasonably effective. I know Senator Kennedy suggested in a speech at Cleveland, yes, the United States. Well, I would say in the latter that the, and that's what I found that somewhat unsatisfactory about the figures, uh, Mr. Nixon, that you used in your previous speech. When you talk about the Truman administration, you, Mr. Truman came to office in 1944 and at the end of the war and uh, for seven and a half years, and comparing him to the last eight years, I'd prefer to take the overall percentage record of the last 20 years of the Democrats and the eight years of the Republicans to show an overall period of growth. In regard to uh, price stability, uh, I'm not aware that that committee did produce recommendations that ever were certainly before the Congress from the point of view of legislation in regard to controlling prices. In regard to the exchange of students, of labor unions, I am chairman of the subcommittee on Africa and I think that one of the most unfortunate phases of our policy towards that country was the very minute number of exchanges that we had I think it's true of Latin America also. We did come forward with a program of students for the Congo of over 300, which was more than the federal government had for all of Africa the previous year. So that I don't think that uh, we have moved, at least in those two areas, with sufficient vigor. The next question to Senator Kennedy from Mr. Warren. Uh, Senator Kennedy, during your brief speech a few minutes ago, you mentioned farm surpluses. 
I'd like to ask this. It's a fact, I think, that presidential candidates traditionally make promises to farmers. Lots of people, I think, don't understand why the government pays farmers for not producing certain crops, or paying farmers if they overproduce, for that matter. Now, uh, let me ask, sir, why can't the farmer operate like the businessman who operates a factory? If an auto company overproduces a certain model car, Uncle Sam doesn't step in and buy up the surplus. Why this constant courting of the farmer? Well, because I think that if the federal government moved out of the program and withdrew its support, uh, then I think you would have complete uh, economic chaos. The farmer plants in the spring and harvests in the fall. There are hundreds of thousands of them. They really don't, they're not able to control their market very well. They bring their crops in or their livestock in, many of them, about the same time. They have only a few purchasers that buy their milk or their hogs, a few large companies in many cases, and therefore the farmer is not in a position to bargain very effectively in the marketplace. I think the experience of the 20s has shown what a free market could do to agriculture. And if the agricultural economy collapses, then the economy of the rest of the United States sooner or later will collapse. The farmers are the number one market for the automobile industry of the United States. The automobile industry is the number one market for steel. So if the farmer's economy continues to decline as sharply as it has in recent years, then I think you would have a recession in the rest of the country. So I think the case for the government intervention is a good one. Secondly, my objection to present farm policy is that there are no effective controls to bring supply and demand into better balance. The dropping of the support price in order to limit production does not work. And we now have the highest uh, surpluses, $9 billion worth. We've had a uh, higher tax load from the Treasury for the farmer in the last few years with the lowest farm income in many years. I think that this farm policy has failed. In my judgment, the only policy that will work will be for effective supply and demand to be in balance, and that can only be done through governmental action. I therefore suggest that in those basic commodities which are supported, that the federal government, after endorsement by the farmers in that commodity, attempt to bring supply and demand into balance attempt effective production controls so that we won't have that 5 or 6 percent surplus which breaks the price 15 or 20 percent. I think Mr. Benson's program has failed. And I must say, after reading the Vice President's speech before the farmers as he read mine, I don't believe that it's very much different from Mr. Benson. I don't think it provides effective governmental controls. I think the support prices are tied to the average market price of the last three years, which was Mr. Benson's theory. I therefore do not believe that this is a sharp enough breach with the past give us any hope of success for the future. Mr. Nixon, comment? I, of course, disagree with Senator Kennedy insofar as his suggestion as to what should be done uh, with the on-the-farm program. He has made the suggestion that what we need is to move in the direction of more government controls, a suggestion that would also mean raising prices uh, that the consumers pay for products and, Im and imposing upon the farmers uh, controls on acreage even far more than they have today. I think this is the wrong direction. I don't think this has worked in the past. I do not think it will work in the future. The program that I have advocated is one which departs from the present program that we have in this respect. It recognizes that the government has a responsibility to get the farmer out of the trouble he presently is in because the government got him into it. And that's the fundamental reason why we can't let the farmer go by himself at the present time. The farmer produced these surpluses because the government asked him to through legislation during the war. Now that we have these surpluses, it's our responsibility to indemnify the farmer during that period that we get rid of the, farmer, uh, the surplus. Until we get the surpluses off the farmer's back, however, we should have a program, such as I announced, which will see that farm income holds up. But I would propose holding that income up not through a type of program that Senator Kennedy has suggested that would raise prices, but one that would indemnify the farmer, pay the farmer in kind uh, from the products which are in surplus. The next question to Vice President Nixon from Mr. Van Oker. Uh, Mr. Vice President, since the question of executive leadership is a very important campaign issue, I'd like to follow Mr. Novin's question. Now, Republican campaign slogans, you see them on signs around the country as you did last week, say, it's experience that counts. That's over a picture of yourself, sir. Uh, implying that you've had more governmental executive decision-making uh, experience than uh, your opponent. Now, in his news conference on August 24th, President Eisenhower was asked to give one example of a major idea of yours that he adopted. His reply was, and I'm quoting, if you give me a week, I might think of one, 
I don't remember. Now, that was a month ago, sir, and the president hasn't brought it up since. And I'm wondering, sir, if you can clarify which version is correct, the one put out by Republican campaign leaders or the one put out by President Eisenhower. Well, I would suggest, Mr. Van Oker, that uh, if you know the president, that was probably a facetious remark. Uh, I would also suggest that insofar as his statement is concerned, that I think it would be improper for the President of the United States to disclose uh, the instances in which members of his official family had made recommendations, as I have made them through the years, to him which he has accepted or rejected. The President has always maintained, and very properly so, that he is entitled to get what advice he wants from his cabinet and from his other advisors without disclosing that to anybody, including, as a matter of fact, to Congress. Now, I can only say this. Through the years, I have sat in the National Security Council, I have been in the cabinet, I have met with the legislative leaders, I have met with the president when he made the great decisions with regard to Lebanon, Kimoy Matsu, other matters. The president has asked for my advice, I have given it. Sometimes my advice has been taken, sometimes it is not. I do not say that I have made the decision, and I would say that no president should ever allow anybody else to make the major decision. The president only makes the decision. All that his advisors do is to give counsel when he asks for it. As far as what experience counts and whether that is experience that counts, that isn't for me to say. Uh, I can only say that my experience is there for the people to consider. Senator Kennedy is there for the people to consider. As he pointed out, we came to the Congress in the same year, now have the opportunity to evaluate his as against mine, and I think both he and I are going to abide by whatever the people decide. Senator Kennedy? Well, I'll just say that the question is of experience, and the question also is uh, what our judgment is of the future, and what our goals are for the United States, and what ability we have to implement those goals. Abraham Lincoln came to the presidency in 1860 after a rather little-known session in the House of Representatives, and after being defeated for the Senate in 58 and was a distinguished president. There is no certain road to the presidency. There are no guarantees that uh, if you take the one road or another that you will be a successful president. I have been in the Congress for 14 years. I have voted in the last uh, eight years. Uh, and the vice president was uh, presiding over the Senate. Which candidate and which party to meet the problem that the United States is going to face in the 60s? The next question to Senator Kennedy from Mr. Novak. Senator Kennedy, in connection with these problems of the future that you speak of and the program that you enunciated earlier in your direct talk, you call for expanding some of the welfare programs for schools, for teacher salaries, medical care, and so forth, but you also call for reducing the federal debt. And I'm wondering how you, if you're president in January, would go about paying the bill for all this. Does this mean uh, that advocate, I did not advocate reducing the federal debt because I don't believe that you're going to be able to reduce the federal debt very much in 1961, 2, or 3. I think you have heavy obligations which affect our security, which we're going to have to meet. And therefore, I've never suggested we should uh, be able to retire the debt substantially or even at all in 1961 Senator, or two. I believe in, in one of your speeches no, you never. suggested that reducing the interest rate would help toward... No, no, not reducing. The uh, however, the kind of programs that I talk about, in my judgment, are uh, fiscally sound. Medical care for the aged, I would put under Social Security. The Vice President and I disagree on this. The program, the Javits... Nixon or the Nixon-Javits program would have cost, if fully used, $600 million by the government per year and $600 million by the state. The program which I advocated, which failed by five votes in the United States Senate, would have put medical care for the agent in Social Security and would have been paid for through the Social Security system and the Social Security tax. Secondly, I support federal aid to education and federal aid for teachers' salaries. I think that's a good investment. I think we're going to have to do it. And I think to heap the burden further on the property tax, which is already strained in many of our communities, will provide, will make, ensure, in my opinion, that many of our children will not be adequately educated and many of our teachers not adequately compensated. There is no greater return to an economy or to a society than an educational system second to none. On the question of the development of natural resources, I would pay as you go, in the sense that they would be balanced and the power of revenues would bring back sufficient money to finance the projects in the same way as the Tennessee bill. Before us all, the faces all Republicans and all Democrats is, can freedom in the next generation conquer or are the communists going to be successful? That's the great issue. And if we meet our responsibilities, I think freedom will conquer. 
If we fail, if we fail to move ahead, if we fail to develop sufficient military and economic and social strength here in this country, then I think that the, the tide could begin to run against us. And I don't want historians ten years from now to say, these were the years when the tide ran out for the United States. I want them to say, these were the years when the tide came in. These were the years when the United States started to move again. That's the question before the American people, and only you can decide what you want, what you want this country to be, what you want to do with the future. I think we're ready to move, and it is to that great task, if we're successful, that we will address ourselves. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This hour has gone by all too quickly. Thank you very much for permitting us to present the next President of the United States on this unique program. I've been asked by the candidates to thank the American networks and the affiliated stations for providing time and facilities for this joint appearance. Other debates in this series will be announced later and will be on different subjects. This is Howard K. Smith. Good night from Chicago. Imagina esto, imagina aquello, imagina carcajadas, imagina viajes, imagina magia, imagina el baile, imagina familia, imagina la lucha, imagina la valentía, imagina el hoy, imagina el mañana. Mira tomorrowpictures.tv